Hi everybody, hello, welcome. This is the second episode of Ants, Bikes and Being Female. It's live with Cycling UK and hello, I'm your host Anna. And we've got some brilliant guests joining us today. It's part of a series where we're aiming, well because so many new people have started cycling during lockdown and we're aiming to give as much advice and information as well as basically some funny stories from experts in the know about cycling to help you on your new cycling journey. Maybe you haven't ridden a bike ever before, maybe you're picking up a bike for the first time in many years or maybe you're actually already a seasoned cycling commuter you like to pick up some extra tips because that is what today is all about it's about cycle commuting so getting to work by bike and what better time to be talking about it now that the government has pledged so we'll see if they hold up to their word to really push for employers to encourage more people to start cycling to work by bike um, and maybe some of you don't feel so comfortable on public transport anymore as well. Uh, the reason we're aiming it at females is because females do actually make up 50% of the population. Yet they only make up about one quarter of the cycling population and there's no need for that. And at Cycling, Community, uh, cycling UK, we are dedicated to closing that gender gap. So visibly showcasing all of these awesome women who are already cycling to work by bike, um, or at least know how to and can give you some brilliant tips. So. I want to know who's listening and why everybody has tuned in today. So what do you want to get out of this? If you've got some questions, we will be trying to answer them. So just get into the chat bar there. Give us your name and let us know where you're tuning in from and let us know a little bit about your cycle commuting life as we introduce our guests. All right, let's go and let's get started with Fran. Hi. Hi, Fran. Some lovely jerseys behind you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, so who are you? Give a little introduction to yourself and um, a little bit of background. So I'm Fran, I'm from Bella Vixen, so we're the home of Women's Cycling Kit. We aim to be that one-stop shop for everybody to come and get any kit that they want, but we also offer the expertise, so I've ridden myself for about 25 years from a whole variety of commuting, mountain biking, road riding and racing. Fantastic, thank you. And next up, we've also got somebody who's no stranger to cycling and racing. It's Charlene Jones. Hi, Anna. Hi, Hello. everyone. <laughs> How are you doing? Obviously, you were here last week, so some people know you, but some people are tuning in for the first time. So if you can give us a little bit of background about you as well, please. Yes, so I am an ex professional cyclist. I rode on the tracks so of velodrome and the road. I've competed in two Commonwealth Games and now I have stopped racing and I'm focusing on fitness and mobility and yoga. So I'll hopefully be able to give you some tips about that later as well. Excellent. Okay, and next up, we've got a cycling instructor. So she really knows her stuff about cycling in urban environments. Kirsty, hello. If you could, it's your first time here, so welcome. Hi. Uh, joining us and let everybody know a little bit about who you are. Uh, Kirsty Grayson, and I run a company called Go Velo that delivers cycling um, instruction across Lancashire. Uh, so we deliver bike ability levels one, two and three, commuter packages, bike maintenance courses and anything to do with cycling and training. Excellent. Well, we couldn't have anyone better than I don't think on the panel today. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. And finally, we've got to welcome okay. the welcome of Cycling UK. It's Jenny. Hey, Jenny. Hi, Anna. So give, give us a little bit of background about yourself as well, please. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Jenny. I work for Cycling UK as um, head of our behaviour change and development team across England. So we run lots of projects across the country to help more people to um, get cycling and return to cycling through community groups and our Big Bike Revival programme. Um, I am a cycle commuter myself um, and enjoy poodling around country lanes at the weekends as well. So a leisure cyclist rather than the super pros that we also have on the panel. <laughs> Excellent. So we've got a brilliant mix. And I've just got a comment here on the on the live comments from Jane, uh, who sh says that she's a nurse and planning on commuting to and from work, looking up, uh, looking for picking up some tips and info. Jenny, uh, could you just give a little bit of a background about what Cycling UK have been doing to support NHS workers and health workers over the course of lockdown? Because Jane brilliant to hear from you and it's a great example of the types of people that we want to say thank you to and help at this time. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's so, so key, Anna. Thank you. So a couple of things that we've been doing um, for uh, key workers and NHS and such social care workers. Um, firstly, we launched our um, membership for key workers. So at Cycling UK, we have a really excellent membership offer and we've been providing free membership for three months for um, health and social care workers throughout lockdown so that they are um, have their insurance covered and cycling safely and lots of tips and advice and guidance um, when cycle commuting um, and we've also been running our big bike revival for key workers program so um, providing grants to small businesses across the country who can um, run doctor bikes bike maintenance bike loans free equipment um, and bike checks for key workers to help keep their bikes safe and roadworthy during um, lockdown as well so we're looking to continue to do that um, but yeah a couple of key things that we've been doing to support key workers at the moment which we're obviously really keen to be able to do and to continue to do um, to help people to continue to cycle and commute on their bikes as well. Excellent thank you so Jane I hope that gives you a little bit of extra information there and I've also got to say a huge thank you to all your work as to those NHS and frontline workers during these difficult times I'm sure everyone here really appreciates what you've been doing as well and um, so on this panel how many of you currently commute to work and I'm talking outside of lockdown situation when I say currently <laughs> We've got Fran, Jenny, Charlene. Um, so Fran, go ahead, tell us a little bit about your commuting situation. So the office is 15 miles away from my home. Um, I'm quite lucky in that I don't actually have to ride through any cities to get to work. So I literally leave one town, I'm in the countryside and I'm riding to the outskirts of Oxford. Um, so I don't have to navigate cities and lots of traffic lights and junctions, but I'm riding down country roads, which sometimes outside of lockdown can be quite busy because people use them as a rat run. Um, but it's a beautiful commute. It's relatively flat. Um, so it's actually it's quite nice and it's a decent distance from a yeah. perspective as well. Yeah, 15 miles each way, so 30 miles a day is pretty yeah. hefty actually I don't do it you don't do it every day no. <laughs> yeah I mean that, that would be clocking up some serious miles through the week and actually later on we're going to be talking a little bit about distances and how you can sort of play maybe a little bit with those options when you do have a further distance to travel um Charlene what about you would you be doing 30 miles a day to commute no <laughs> <laughs> even no. when you were pro racing were you doing that sort of distance <laughs> Oh, a lot Probably more than been, you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, because I work from different places. So one day I live in Glasgow and sometimes I work out of uh, the Hamden, the Hampton Stadium, which is the national football stadium and underneath they have a little clinic. But anyway, that's only three miles from my house. And then the other like my studio, Dynamic Fitness Studio, is three miles the opposite way. So yeah it, it really it's really easy for me and it's in the city as well there's lots of different ways you can go so I can make it interesting and sometimes if one if it's a certain time of day I can avoid busier traffic roads Um, if it's during the day and there's not much traffic I can just go straight along you know the, the main busy roads which aren't bus aren't as busy during the day um, but a, a little tip, um, definitely, if you're looking to commute, is to to if you've never done it before, is to get a map out on Google and just plan out your route before you leave. And also for the first time, leave lots of time. Even maybe do it after work or at the weekend. So you're like, right, when you're gonna I'm gonna go on Monday, I've got the route planned. I know what I'm doing. I've done it before. So you could maybe go there and then you could ride back at the weekend or something so that you feel like, right, I, I know the way. And always leave plenty more time, especially at rush hour, not because of traffic, but if you, from personal experience, because I live in the city in Glasgow, the traffic lights are always timed differently as well. <laughs> Those traffic lights, one day, like they're just all green, the next day they can turn red. So yeah, big tip for me is plan your route. Uh, you'll get to know the traffic light systems and things like that, but always leave plenty of time and then you'll you'll get your tip. But you'll be fine. And, and no jumping lights. I love how you've brought that in as well. Fantastic. <laughs> you know, cyclists have to obey the same rules as car drivers. It's a traffic light and it's red, you've got to stop as well. Jenny, Charlene just sort of mentioned there about route planning. So 
Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that as well as your own sort of personal cycle commuting experiences. So why don't we go in with the route planning because Cycling UK offers something that really does help commuters. Yeah, absolutely. So um, our route planning page on our website gives you a few different options for how you can plan your commute. So Charlene, absolutely right there. And that was going to be one of my top tips as well is plan your route before you go um, and give it a, a practice as well. So the journey planner that we've got will give you um, the quietest option on the roads. Um, um, the balanced option and then the quickest option if you've left it that last five minutes to shove stuff in your bag before you get on the bike. Um, so the journey plan is a really helpful tool and will give you lots of different options around your commute to work. Um, so that's something that's that's really um, helpful for lots of people and I think that um, I had a point and it's completely gone out of my head of what I was going to say. So <laughs> Um, we, we can come back to it. So it's about the journey planners. And why don't you tell us a bit about oh, your... I've remembered, I've remembered. Um, when planning your route, um, don't assume that the route that you might have taken before on the bus or in your car is the best route to cycle as well. Um, I think especially if you're in a town or a city, there's ways that you can get through on quieter roads or slightly different routes that are perhaps more direct than what your public transport route might have taken you. So it's worth doing that plan and not just assuming that you know the way um, because you've done it every day for many, many years. So um, yeah, always worth just sort of checking out the different options for that. Um, yeah. And can, I I just, also, um, can I just say something there about what you said about not assuming it's the same route because it could also be off-putting as well if people have been only accustomed to driving on an A road or something like that, they might think that that's the only way to get to work. So be daunted that there aren't other options and quieter roads that you can take yeah and I think it's also worth looking out around the office if there's other people that are commuting by bike um is there a colleague that you could cycle with perhaps um someone that can do the route with you for the first couple of times perhaps if you're a little nervous if it's something you've not done before and look for a bike buddy to help you um just while you get more confident cool and you you work at a place where it's very actively encouraged <laughs> cycle as much as possible because you're actually working with Cycling UK. So what's your distance from work to um, to your home and do you, do you go by bike ever? Yeah so I um, like Charlene I'm really close to work it's only um, sort of just less than three miles really um, and for me my commute I do it in various ways of just based on what's best to suit around my lifestyle. Um, I travel quite a lot with work so if I'm going into London I'll grab a, um, a higher bike from Waterloo Station and cycle to the office that way, um, or I'll cycle to um, the office if I'm at head office. Um, I actually walk to work quite a lot as well, because I think there's so much um, that we'll talk about, about headspace and it you know, being good for your well-being, and um, a good walk uh, helps me that way as well. So uh, yeah, I mix it up between cycling and walking, depending on um, what my day looks like, but yeah it's always good fun to have that kind of just blast on the bike to get to work as well at the start of the day yeah absolutely and Kirsty you're a cycling instructor and and uh dedicated to the world but actually you work from home so that's that's pretty yeah. much shortened your cycling commute <laughs> absolutely uh 16 steps more or less to where <laughs> I work so I can't comment on the commuting side but certainly from the cycling instruction um, and you've all brought up some really, really good points um, just now with regards to obviously planning the route, um, which route you're going to take, how you're actually going to ride, not jumping through red lights and all of that technical stuff that you really, really need to get hold of um, and understand and get to grips with. Um, one thing that I really would recommend is that if people are planning on riding to work is get in touch with a local authority. They'll put you in touch with some cycle instructors and you can actually pair up with them um they could do what charlene said and take you out of hours so maybe do it on a sunday initially uh ride your route get to know it and then ride during your commuter time with somebody else so that they can talk you through all the traffic lights roundabouts all the stuff that you wouldn't normally want to ride through um so they can more or less hold your hand initially brilliant isn't it and, and pretty much throughout the whole of the uk that's an option. Obviously, we've got someone in the background there. <laughs> in the room, all going off. Excellent. Hello. And <laughs> uh, take what you need. Yeah, I'm going to take a moment to read through some of the comments that we've got coming in uh, because Rachel has been loving riding with so little traffic. 
on the roads, but pretty, pretty nervous about traffic as she rides on the back of a tandem. That's unusual, visually impaired. So it's brilliant that you found a, a solution to getting you to be able to cycle on the roads. Um, and how she wants to ask how we can get involved in campaigning to keep all these wonderful new cyclists on bikes and getting involved in cycle friendly road campaigns. And it's a really good question because, I mean, that's part of what we're trying to do here today is try and work out how we can keep all these wonderful new cyclists on bikes. You know, we're all thinking the same thing. We're all working towards the same thing at the moment. Um, any, uh, Jenny, it's a bit of a campaigns question. For somebody who wants to get involved in cycle-friendly road campaigns, what could they do? Where could they go? Um, well, our campaigns team at Cycling UK would be a really great place to start. Um, we are currently running uh, campaigns with local councils to encourage more space for cycling and walking and continuing the temporary infrastructure that's um, going up all over the country at the moment to support more um, cycling and, and to maintain social distancing during that time as well. Um, so getting in touch with our campaigns team about what's happening locally to you um, is a really good place to start and we've got loads of excellent volunteers all around the country that are supporting those um, campaigns that we're running and being our sort of people on the ground to, to help um, share the message and encourage that um, continued sort of campaign for cycling. So from a campaign's perspective I'd say start there um, and just keeping an eye on what's happening um, in your local area. So we're currently sharing um, on our website maps of where all of the temporary infrastructure is going in and what plans local authorities and councils have got in place just to really celebrate all those excellent bits of infrastructure that are popping up um, at the moment. So it's worth just checking out what's happening in your local area for now um, to see where um, plans are being changed and infrastructure um, developments are happening. Cool. And um, Fran, this is one for you. And actually, if you can just keep it quite short, because we're going to be going into office um, issues a little bit later on, but it's just made me laugh because uh, someone said, fellow Vixen, addicted to buying from your website, it's a problem. <laughs> That's nice to hear. Um, and Robin says, any info on whether work showers can be used at to work? Actually, no, sorry, that's one for Jenny. Um, Fran, the one that I had for you was about dry shower gel, because you mentioned that as we were behind the scenes a second ago um, about coming to the office, going to the warehouse and not being able to have a shower so you can yes. give us some well there's two wonderful things that um i well three really baby wipes dry shower gel and dry shampoo all of them work amazingly really i was always surprised and thought oh you know dry shampoo is not for me at all you know it's just going to make my hair look horrible but it actually all, they all work really really well and it's amazing well how much you can <laughs> spruce yourself up in in five minutes you know we've only got a sink about this big in the um in the toilet so yeah um all things to to look out for and that are easy to to buy <laughs> cool uh, so what if somebody's thinking about commuting to work and this is one for the audience as well for those of you who have already started cycle commuting uh, our guest tell us what do you think are the best things about cycle commuting why is it worth it uh, Fran, again, we'll start with you. And and also the audience, please give your comments in the live chat as well. I would love to see why you think cycle commuting is valuable. I guess, I guess for me, it's the fresh air and the stress busting thing. You know, you can leave work at the end of the day when it's been manic and you're tired and within five minutes of riding, it's all forgotten. Um, I rode to work yesterday and there was deer running down the road in front of me because I was in the countryside, like, <laughs> You don't think of work, you don't think of problems in your life, it doesn't matter if the weather's bad, um, it's just that fresh air and, and freedom feeling for me. Excellent. Charlene, can you relate to that? You're in more of yeah. an urban environment though. Boxes made me for Charlene. Pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, yeah, it's just nice to not sit in a car. And actually, like, when you're in the city, I feel like you get to the destination at the same time you would if you were in a car or less <laughs> because the traffic lights, so you can just go straight up. If it's if it's um, safe, you can just go straight up the inside where the cycle um, section is to the front where they should have a little cycle box bit where you can sit for the, the lights ready to go. So for me, it, it's just faster <laughs> zooming along it's faster and um yeah nice nice fresh air 
it's just nice to get something get the body moving before you have to use your brain you know yeah. to get to get moving switch everything on and just and that's something you're a bit of an expert in uh, in your personal training life as well. I guess you have to motivate people as much about getting into the right headspace as well as just getting their body working. And so what about doing a bit of exercise before work? How does that help with your productivity and your mental activity? Yeah, I mean, as I said, it's just, it's just going to switch everything on, get everything working correctly, get you more fired up, more focused. Um, I always believe that moving your body, and especially outside if you can, um, can just give you a better start to the day. It's just a great way of releasing those endorphins, but actually without even knowing it, you're releasing those good hormones so that you have a good day. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a good way to start your day and uh, just definitely especially especially right now with um what the whole of the uk and the world is going through it's important to feel good in the morning and yeah echo there <laughs> trying to <laughs> in what i'm saying but yeah. um jenny you you that's Something that is a reason why you choose active travel to get to work, walking and cycling, that's sort of what you implied earlier on. Is there anything else you'd like to add on that? Because we've seen in some of the comments as well, people are saying carbon commission, um, carbon emissions. So it's not just about you, is it, as well? That you're yeah, doing good things absolutely. There's definitely that bigger picture. And I think, you know, we all know and, and have experienced, you know, in this panel, the benefits of, you know, cycling to work and how that makes you feel. But we're also thinking about the bigger picture stuff that we've started to see. So, you know, drops in air pollution, um, you know, reduction in congestion and the creating that space for um, key workers or for, you know, to get to work and for cycling and walking. I think there's definitely a lot that we can all do to take responsibility for those positive changes in our towns and cities um, as we sort of move out of um, current lockdown and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. And for me, definitely to not be sitting for a while when you're you know in meetings and at your desk and everything all day to have that at the beginning of the end of the day is definitely a, a real positive that um 40 percent means that you get home feeling refreshed rather than stressed from the end of the work day and kirsty from the sort of feedback you get from all the people that you train and your trainers train what are the main reasons why people enjoy commuting to work by bike I think in most instances, it's like you said, it's just really, really nice way to start the day. Get out there in the fresh air and when the sun's been shining as it has been for the last few weeks, um, what better way to actually get to work? Um, especially with what's happening at the moment, it's just really, really hard work for people. Uh, it's just nice to let off a bit of steam and just appreciate good surroundings. Um, and the, the de-stress of it all, fabulous. And so would one of your tips be that if someone is first start thinking about cycling to work, do it in the sunshine, do it when there's good weather? Oh, without a doubt, yes. I mean, this is perfect. You've seen so many, in a massive increase in cycling over the last couple of weeks, simply because the weather's been so, so good and there's been fewer cars on the road and people are at home. So just got to keep that going, haven't we, really? Um, but yeah, definitely do it when it's good weather. That's that's for getting started because there's so many barriers of people getting started, just taking that first step in the first place. But once you do get into it, it's not necessarily a reason not to continue once the weather gets bad. Yeah. Pam, what's your opinion on cycling when the weather isn't great? And Charlene, I bet you've got something to say from this as well, being up in Edinburgh. <laughs> I think it's one of those things it's get it's back to what you just said it's getting over that first hurdle once you start commuting in good weather and you realize how much better it makes you feel then weather becomes no barrier um you know you go out there you you start buying the right kit you might not have it all when you start but as you enjoy riding more you start building up your kit wardrobe you introduce a waterproof some warmer thicker clothes for the winter it, it becomes no excuse and you might actually find like we discussed at the end last week is riding in the rain can be quite exhilarating and quite satisfying you know everyone else is sat at home moaning the weather's rubbish but you've just ridden five miles your stresses have gone and you're fine and it's you know and it's great so you know kit is not an excuse but then i would say that 
<laughs> well, actually, some people in the comments are saying the same thing as well. Um, you know, once you get into the routine of ro uh, riding to work, bad weather doesn't bother people. And actually, it doesn't quite happen as often as we think it does. Will has also said it doesn't rain on the commute as much as you might think. And I remember seeing a statistic, and I wish I could remember it because this is a pretty rubbish, <laughs> rubbish quote without it. But there's some sort of statistic about how little it does actually rain during rush hours during the year i don't know if any of you happen to know this statistic off the top of your head no but anyway it's really low it's we have this perception that it's raining all the time in england it's not um and especially during those hours of rush hour charlene up in scotland what's the weather mean for your cycle commute <laughs> um well I live in Glasgow, so actually I've noticed a big difference coming from the east because I did live in Fife, which is near Edinburgh, and I now live in the west, and it's so much wetter in Glasgow. But you have, like, for me, I have to have the correct clothing on because I just get so cold. So just gloves, like, make sure your hands are warm, your feet are warm, even, like, a little bandana or, like, a woolly hat underneath your helmet just to keep um, parts of your body's really, really um, warm would help. Um, uh, obviously, if it's um, if it's warm and it rains, it's fine. It's the cold. It's the cold that gets me. So, um, actually, when it, the great thing is, if it's not raining and you go out and then it starts to rain, that's totally fine. Um, but if you if it's raining and you're like like should I go should I not and you you like, just want to go just make sure you've got you know a good waterproof on you're going to keep dry um, and so that you you look after yourself because uh, you get the wind chill as well on the bike so make sure you're nice and warm. I was so, going to yeah. say I hate wind more than I hate rain. To be fair, yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, unless it's behind you. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm outside the office, and you can see. So I know which way the wind is going to be for my home commute. <laughs> so I can sit at work and dread riding home. So I know I've got a hoofing headwind. Well, that's just great because there's nothing you can do about it either. Once you're at work, you're not, getting back how you're getting back. There's no decision to be made. It's just either dread or happiness. <laughs> exactly. And once you get on the bike, it's fine. You forget about it again, don't you? But good lights as well. Good lights is always a. Uh, that's that is going to come up in the comments. Um, and I don't know if you've heard about the Garmin Varia light, which is the one with the radar. No, go on. So there's a Garmin Varia light, which is a rear light, which will identify the cars coming from behind. And on your screen, it will beep and it will pick up the cars way before you can hear them. Um, and the, li the little dot moves up your screen, which is the car, and it shows you as it's getting closer to you. So if you're not a particularly confident rider, it might just help you a bit more knowing that a car is approaching because you can see it on your garment before you can hear it. Yeah, Charlene? And you know what, that is, I did not know that that was a thing and that is amazing because there's so many times that a car just comes and you're maybe not concentrating and you're like, oh, oh. but it's because you're not concentrating. <laughs> Having that little screen there and also I've got, um, I've got a friend who's deaf and that would be, amazing so she wants to get into cycling and that's the thing so maybe like a mirror if a mirror to the side yeah. so you can see the traffic and also or the, that little screen thing that's amazing it's kind of coded as well so it will go green if the car's going at a certain speed red if it's going considerably faster so also the color coding gives you an idea what speed the car's approaching at that's there's amazing. so much technology that that's really helpful and useful yeah Kirsty, you got something to add a bit of a freaky unique tip that if you you know obviously if you've got a computer there and you can see that something is coming towards you but it's quite far away get yourself turning around to try and make eye contact with the driver and that way there's that human to human eye contact um they don't just say oh there's a you know there's a bike there's actually a person on a bike and that really then makes a human connection that they will maybe slow down Give you the space that you need um so just keep making eye contact with other road users if that's fundamental because i did uh, cycle instructing as well uh, a few years back and i think the biggest for me anyway the biggest takeaway i got from it if i was to pass on like one snippet of advice for cycling on the road 
it's see and be seen mm -hmm. concept. It, if, you, if you're looking all the time and you can see what other road users are doing, but also building on what Kirsty said, you know that you've been seen, you've made eye contact. Mm -hmm. Really, all of the rest of it is kind of the cherry on top because once you can see and you can control a little bit more what's going on with that CNBC scene, to me, that would be the number one top tip. But if, if anyone else got some other little gems like that for cycling on the road, cycle safety that makes you feel um, So I would say own the space that you're riding in and don't ride in the gutter. So we have a habit of not being confident on the road. You're always told to stay on the left-hand side, obviously in the UK. And we all ride down the gutter like a centimetre out from the edge of the grates, if not over the grates. Don't come about a foot out and have that confidence. As Kirsty said, look around, be aware what's going on around you, make eye contact with people. But also then road users, you know, see you more. You are, you know, they can notice you as the most vulnerable road user. Um, and they're ready then to react as to, you know, how you do. Charlene. Oh, you, you're muted. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Here I am. Just to um, add to that, um, what Fran and Kirsty said, when you are on the road and there's potholes, so you might be commuting and there might be a, a road that you know and there's potholes. If you know where they are, then you need to make eye contact with drivers as well that are coming, put your hand out if you can, or just kind of move so that they know that you're gonna move out. And like most of the time, they will slow down, let you go because you've made an effort to tell them. Whereas if you just go, then, you know, it's like a, a respect both ways kind of thing. You know, you're all on the road together, we're sharing the roads. To make eye contact with the drivers it's safer for everyone uh, if you can look round and if you don't feel confident looking round then i would definitely urge you to practice on quiet roads or like i said last week maybe somewhere that is has not got any cars and you can just ride round maybe like a, a car park after hours that's not being used and you can just practice looking over your shoulders, taking your arm out to signal, very important things when you're on the road can help you. Even, I don't know, maybe like an elbow kind of, like I'm going that way and a little look if you can't look right now, just like a little kind of signal. They should know if there's a car parked out on the street as well, if you need to pull out that you're going to pull out, but it's nice to let them know as well. Communication. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And, and people are all in the comments here. People are sort of agreeing. Cara saying primary positioning mm -hmm. on the road to make you more visible in car drivers' eyes. So again, about uh, visibility. Uh, Kirsty, and again, people say, uh, Kathy here, make sure drivers see you. Yes, own the space. So, Kathy, I feel like you've got a little bit more to build on this as well with your experience. Yeah, I was just going to uh, bring up what Cara and also what uh, Sharon Chapel has just written. Um, you know, primary position is really, really key to this. So primary position is more or less in the centre of your lane of traffic. Um, so if you are riding along, you would be able to control the speed of the traffic behind you. Um, so that's really key if you don't want people to with and overtake you. Um, it gives you more visibility ahead and also you can be seen far more clearly by people behind you. So that primary position, which is the centre of your lane of traffic, uh, not the centre of the road, I'm just going to make that really clear, uh, <laughs> centre of your lane of traffic, um, by doing that you really do have a, a protective bubble around you. Um, you've also got a load more wriggle room uh, against the curb so if you do need to move in you've got an awful lot of space to move into um, but you don't really want to be doing that you want to be holding your lane of traffic and controlling the traffic around you yeah so and it, can, it can be quite different as well commuting in urban environments as opposed to say like Fran here who's on country roads um, just a little one for the audience where do people tend to prefer cycle because they come with their own set of challenges and the urban environments there tends to be a lot more traffic it's heavy there's a lot going on you've got to have your wits about you a little bit more but it's slower whereas on the country roads there's often quite a lot of fast moving flowing traffic 
Fran, what, what's it like for you cycling on the country roads and what tips could you give to people who've got to cycle in that sort of environment? Uh, it's not, I mean, obviously in lockdown, it's been beautiful. Like there's been days when I've managed to ride the whole way and not part, not see another car. Um, it's obvious that people are, are back to work and the, the cars are um, clearly more prevalent on the road. I guess the top tip on that is the visibility because cars are coming around corners. But also car drivers do tend to be more aware that there will be stuff around corners. So there may be farmers, tractors, you know, cows crossing the road. So, it, it, yes, the traffic is faster, but I do also think people can drive with more care than if in the city they do it every single day and they switch off. So, you know, back to visibility of bright clothing, lights. Um, and the key thing, I think, uh, on the country roads, well, you probably do still get in the city, actually, is potholes. Um, the the cities do tend to be a bit more main well um, well maintained than some of the country roads, but just be aware a puddle is probably a, a, a massive hole. So if you're riding down the road and you can avoid, there you go. Someone Nadia's just said exactly what I've just said is if you see a big patch of water on the road, don't assume it's safe to ride through. I always take it that it's a massive pothole. Um, and I also believe that's where Danny Rowe, now King, had her nasty accident many years back as a pro was, you know, hitting a pothole that was water, basically. So. Yeah. And if you do hit a pothole, Jenny, what could people do? Well, Janet has very handily just popped it uh, in the comments there for us. Um, but you can use the uh, Cycling UK Fill That Hole app, which is um, where you can record potholes that you've seen on your route. Um, and then they can be reported back um, to the relevant council for um, action. And every week we have a pothole week. And I can't remember exactly when that is in the year, but it's not very long ago. And so we have a big focus on um, reporting uh, potholes and any potential um, risks that might be associated with that. Yeah, and it does work and it does make a difference. So if anyone here does notice potholes on their journey, please do report it uh, because you'll be helping other cyclists as well. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about distance as well, because some people aren't really prepared to cycle 30 miles a day, as might be the case for someone like Fran. Uh, what what can people do to balance that out? Because, I mean, surely commuting sometimes or a little bit is better by bike is better than completely never doing it. So, Fran, what do you do? Because you've got a mammoth journey. Well, for starters, I don't ride every day because that would kill me. I would be knackered. I tend to drive in on a Monday when I bring in my food for the week and all my clothes and everything I need for the week, which then also for me means I don't have to ride with a rucksack. I don't have a different bike for commuting like a lot of people may. Um, I just ride my nice, decent road bike. So I, I don't put panniers on. I don't like riding with a rucksack. So that would be one tip is break it down. Do maybe, you know, start off by doing one day a week. Or I have a friend actually who doesn't want to ride 20 miles to work, but drives part of the way. You know, that's another option if you've got somewhere yeah. safe that you can leave your car is she'll drive 10 miles and then she'll ride 10 miles into work. Um, so there's a whole host of options out there depending on where you live and where you work and, and all the other environments around it. Yeah, and transport can be quite complicated as well. I've seen somebody mention in Teesside, I think they've stopped allowing bikes. That's much further up, so Nick, it might take your time to find it, but it's something about not allowing bikes um, on the trains anymore. Yeah. I think and the in trains went through a phase of the early stages of COVID, didn't they? They stopped people just jumping on trains with bikes. Yeah, but you can take folding bikes on the train. At least I'm talking uh, from London. That's where I know about. So correct me if anyone's got any more information on their specific areas. But in London, you can take folding bikes on the train. So that's an option. And in many places, you could have your bikes locked up outside the station. They've got that in Guildford, don't they, Jenny, near the Cycling UK offices? From what I've yeah. yeah, there's cycle storage there. I think it's um, the trains is, is quite a, a bigger um, issue there. And I think like you say all train providers do it differently and there's different rules at different times of the day and that sort of thing but lots of stations now are either having um bike hire um schemes um or have done previously um or have yes cycle storage at the stations for that to be an option as well 
Yeah, cool. And somebody else is uh, Kerry's. She's commented on lengthy commutes, and this is really sweet. It's handy to have someone who works and lives near you. So my twenty-four mile commute um, would sometimes mean my work buddy gave me a lift home, and I would ride back another day. And I guess that's about building a little bit the culture of cycling within your workplace and that again is something that Cycling UK are focusing on quite heavily. So for the audience how many of you have facilities in your workplaces that make cycling to work easier? I'm talking about things like showers, bike storage and what other things do you think would really encourage people to cycle to work if their employers provided it? Like Kirsty, what sort of feedback you get from people that are maybe off put or get put off cycling to work because things aren't provided in the workplace what sort of things do people like oh I think I think we've actually lost her there so anybody else want to raise a hand and talk a little bit about workplaces so uh, you don't have a shower at work Fran so you sorted <laughs> that out with um <laughs> as you said with some some baby wipes and some dry shower um products what other things do you think might get people encouraged i guess the bike storage is key isn't it and depends on the kind of bike you're riding as i've already mentioned i ride my decent road bike i would not lock that up outside obviously working in velovix and i'm lucky i just bring it into the office um but obviously that is going to be a massive factor for you know for people cycling to work is where can they leave their bike and is it going to be safe um I guess Cycling UK, Jenny, have done a lot of work around maybe the different options of bike storage for businesses. Yeah, absolutely. And through the um, Cycle Friendly Employer Accreditation, we're doing lots of work um, with businesses across the country to be more cycle friendly um, and all the different options and sort of different levels of what colleagues would need and expect from their workplace. Um, and yeah, cycle storage is obviously a really crucial part of that. Yeah, and over to you, Kirsty. We lost you for a second there. So yeah, sorry, I went to <laughs> trying to hear your, your tips. Um, yeah, um, Lancashire County Council are really lucky in Lancashire, but if any any of the listeners are from Lancashire and you've got you go into work, um, there's an access fund which um, allows for cycling to work grant, which means that um, workplaces can apply for money for showers bike storage, um, bike hire, all sorts of things like that. So it's not just a Lancashire scheme, I don't think. So it is a, it is government money from the DFT as part of the access fund. So get in touch with your councils and get them to apply for it. Because um, that's something that the £5,000 can go quite a long way. That's awesome. And uh, that sort of facilities does seem to be um, causing a little bit of outrage in the comments here. I think people do feel... <laughs> by not having great facilities and it can be a barrier putting people off cycling and people are talking about kit as well you know, uh, Filippo says it'd be encouraging if people in the office didn't care if you wore more casual attire let's stop the suited and booted madness such a waster of time I mean we could go off on a bit of a tangent there but keeping it about cycling and clothing solutions here what what's Many, there are many different solutions, whether it's wearing clothing, changing their clothing culture in the office, or changing when you get to work. So Fran's going to have loads to say on this, but we'll come to you last. Charlene, when you just ride to your three miles to your studio, do you wear separate clothing? No, I usually, it, um, not if it's nice. If it's um, raining, then I'm always going to take a change of clothes because I don't want to be um, be working in my wet clothes and, and get ill from that. So I just have a little rucksack that I can tie around the front and around the waist and it's just nice and secure. It doesn't really even feel like I've got a bag on. Um, and I just shove some dry clothes in, in my bag so that I've got some for when I get there. But I don't always change into it. And because I go to a studio and I go and do exercise, um I it's just all the same <laughs> I just keep it on and then jump on my bike home and then have a shower when I get home so it just depends where you're going I guess if you're going to an office where you have to wear a suit and um, I would probably put that in my bag <laughs> and, and make sure it's in a plastic bag if you've not got a waterproof bag so it stays nice and dry and, uh, and maybe roll it up so it doesn't get crinkled as well Yes, exactly. Roll it up, roll it up. But definitely um, 
it just depends what your job is and what your uniform is. If you're, I don't know, a physio or a doctor and you want to cycle to work in a hospital and you've got your scrubs, I, I mean, I would put them in my bag as well. So, um, yeah, it just it's all dependent on what you want, what where you're going, what your commute is for, and where where your workplace is. Definitely individual. Yeah. Yeah, it's very individual, actually, isn't it? Fran, what sort of offerings do you guys have at Fellow Vixen? What, uh, and when, I guess you probably, you get people emailing you a lot, asking you for tips and advice. So what sort of things come up when it comes to clothing, commuting, office wear? So I guess the key thing for us is it's often people that are riding shorter distances that want a bit of padding but don't necessarily want to be fully lycraed up. So we have a great range of padded pants which is literally a chamois pad in a pair of knickers that you can wear under your normal jeans, mm -hmm. under your whatever clothes you decide to ride in. And, you know, they, they, they fold up really small. They're easy to wash, quick to dry, um, and then you can change at the office. But there's also a great brand called Velocity Cycle Wear who actually do commuting trousers. Um, so they're made of, like, a toughened, water-resistant material. Again, you could probably put your... your I'd put my padded pants under them, but also you can roll. If you, when you roll the right leg up, there's a reflective strip around the bottom, um, so a bit more visibility. Um, we've, got, I mean, we've got a huge range. I could talk for, forever about kit. So all I would say is, if people want more specific advice, longer term about cycling kit, um, they can email us to the, the contact at bellavixen.com, and I can I can be more specific to their needs and requirements. Yeah, I know that you guys are particularly good at doing that, at like helping people find specifically what they need. There's a comment from Ray there who says their their employer, the Environment Agency, provide changing rooms, showers, lockers, and secure bike storage. Wow. It's pretty much what it looks like <laughs> at Cycling UK, and and I'm sure it does help encourage people to cycle to work. Um, Kirsty, what other barriers do you find that people come come against when they're trying to make that decision between cycling to work? or using other forms? Well, I think this, the, I mean, you've discussed the clothing, you've discussed the weather, um, the cycle training element, the routes. So all in common, really, um, it's all of those things. And if we can break down every single one of those barriers um, and have lovely flat roads with sunshine all the time, then I think we've cracked it, haven't we? Yeah. So just a case of making sure that everybody's encouraged and given the right tools to be able to do so um and i think really from my point of view cycle training is a big one um making sure that people feel safe and have got the necessary know-how to be able to do so and that's what you said for get people feeling safe so i think that's a vital point isn't it cycling on the roads is actually inherently pretty safe Yes, but people don't feel yeah. safe, and it's about changing that perceptions in some ways as well. Have you got anything to say on that? And I can see Charlene's nodding away. So if you want to say something afterwards, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean it's just a, just a case of just making sure that people do what we've said already: is make good eye contact with other road users, create that space for yourself, um, make sure that when you're overtaking parked cars that you give that extra distance between yourself and the car, have a right good look in it, make sure they're not about to drive off at junctions, hold the road, hold the traffic, look around you. Um, signal when you need to signal, but the rest of the time have your hands on your handlebars, covering your brakes, and be in control of your bike. Um, so that's creating, um, you know, taking ownership of your own safety as such. But like you said before, statistically, that is inherently a safe thing to do. Cool. And I've just seen um, Diane, she's commented, and this, I mean, Oh, it's so embarrassing. Make sure the ladies take their underwear. They should be riding commando if you're wearing padded cycling shorts. And it's so true. You can get to work. Hopefully, I'm not the only one who cycled to work in your padded shorts and then realised you've forgotten your knickers. What are you going to do? You're at work and you're Nicholas. <laughs> and we've all been there. We've all had our embarrassing moments through cycling to work and commuting. And sometimes you do just have to sort of take the plunge. Jenny, you intrigued me yesterday because you said you had an embarrassing cyber community <laughs> story, but you didn't tell me what it was. So now it's your moment. I'm dying to know. <laughs> didn't um, tell however, but you can tell however many thousand people. Yeah. Are. So, <laughs> yeah. On, on the spotlight. <laughs> it's, um, it's linked to the to the cycling in the rain chat that we were talking about earlier. Um, in a previous job, it was again just a couple of miles to work. 
and I um, was fairly new to cycle commuting. So I was really proud of myself. I had my, I had a, it was forecast of rain. So I had a change of clothes in my backpack and I was, I was like, well, I'll just change my clothes when I get to work. The roads are a bit wet, so I'll change my shoes and all the rest of it. Two minutes after I left the flat, the heavens opened and it was just torrential. I got absolutely drenched, but I was like, it's fine. I've got my dry clothes in my bag. I've got good changing facilities at work, so I'll be ready to go when I get there. And I turned up at work and I had all these kind of like, oh, poor you. And oh, dear, are you OK? And I was like, well, I'm fine. I've got my waterproof coat on. I'm literally like, I'm going to go get changed. Everything's fine. And then I got down to the changing rooms and realised two things. That, well, firstly, my backpack was absolutely not waterproof, so all my dry clothes were now drenched. <laughs> and secondly, the makeup that I would put on so carefully before I left my flat was now all down my face. So my two top tips for cycling in the rain were firstly, waterproof mascara, which is now a staple as part of my life, and a waterproof cover for your backpack so that when you've smugly got your clothes, they do actually remain dry in the time that it takes to cycle in the rain to work. So I was so pleased with myself, but I'm not bothered about the rain. I'm going to get there. I'm smug. Everything's brilliant. And looked like an absolute drowned rat by the time I got there. So you no. only make those sorts of mistakes once. <laughs> and that was my one time. <laughs> so, yeah. And hopefully those um, tuning in today won't have to make that mistake because you've done it for them. Thank exactly. you, Jenny. You are Very welcome. Kind of you. <laughs> Right, um, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Ray has commented, and men, yes, men also need to go commando with their padded shorts, don't forget your undies when you go there. And um, yeah, so things like that. I really hope the people have got really good tips out of this. We're going to all leave at the same time, but I would like to do what we did last week where you pick out a comment or a question. So if it's a question that you don't feel that it has been answered and you'd like to answer it, Fran, there's one particularly there about padded pants so that's probably going to be your one uh, quite recently so if you can all just take a moment to pick out some comments and one by one we'll go through them before we leave today so Charlene do you want to go and let us know your comment or your question a spotted one Jamie Knighton I'm a fair weather cyclist more frequent sunny weather would be great I am so with you there <laughs> if Scotland <laughs> have a little more sun i'd just be so happy <laughs> love that <laughs> really agree there although it hasn't stopped you cycling you just wish it was sunny more <laughs> i just wish it was i just wish of course it doesn't <laughs> wish we're thinking kirsty off you go i i just want to say this name because it's amazing right filippo eric negroni I love your comment. It would be encouraging if people in the office didn't care if you wore more casual attire. Let's stop the suited and booted madness. Such a waste of time. I'm up for that. I think it's a good idea. If we could be casual most of the time, then people wouldn't have to worry about all the makeup and the lovely clothes and stuff for work. It, yeah, it's true. And I, I wonder if lockdown is going to have provided something about a bit of culture change there because people do seem to be getting a little bit more casual um you know backgrounds have become casual more casual and video calls and you know sometimes you do see people with their slippers on so maybe it's going to lead to a bit of a style cultural change in the office we'll see um jenny have you picked out any comments that caught your eye or question um there was a question from just before we started actually which i thought um i could just pick up on before we go around insurance um and the importance of having um, insurance uh, while you're um, cycling. Um, so a, the question was around insuring your bike um, and having third party liability for yourself and um, personal accident insurance. Um, and it's a bit of a, a plug, really. But we talked at the very beginning about the membership for key workers. But we've also got our new back on your bike um, membership, which is £15 for six months that covers you for bike insurance for the first month and then um, you can get discounted offers on that after that but then your third party um, liability and your personal uh, accident insurance is covered covered through the membership so worth just checking that out the links on there that if you are a new commuter do take a look at um, the membership offer um, and and how you can uh, be covered for um, both you and your bike whilst you're commuting. Thank you brilliant thank you so much for that and Fran which have you picked out? Well, I, I just have to answer that one from Ruth that you highlighted about the padded pants. She asks, do they get worn all day? Are five pairs for a working week expensive and are they better than a saddle cover? 
you can wear them all day if you want, but my point is they're that small that they will go up in, you know, they will fold up into a very small purse or handbag. Um, you don't really need five pairs. You could get away with two pairs because they're super lightweight, so they wash and they would dry very quickly overnight. We do do an offer if you buy two pairs. Are they better than a padded saddle cover? Um, personally, I think so. I'm not a fan of the padded saddle covers. I think with the right saddle, right saddle position and the pants, you will have no problems at all. So my final top tip for commuting before we end is to be alert be visible, be courteous, and ride safely. And as the Italians say, sempre in cellar, always riding. Love it. Beautiful. And my comment is going to be this one from Sharon Chapel, who says, lip gloss and hair not tied up do not go together. And it's so <laughs> true when your hair is in the wind on the bike, and then you just turn up at work looking like you're doing your own Movember. So thanks for that. Um, and that's all we've got time for this week. So thank you everyone for your comments. Like you say, it's been a bit gender neutral this time, so it's nice to see that there's some guys have been watching as well. But next week, we're moving on to the girl stuff and we're going to be talking about periods and training. Yeah, so make sure you keep it here at Cycling UK for those girls. We're going to be going into some topics that are sometimes a little bit more difficult uh, to cover and that questions that don't always get answered publicly. So here is the space to do it. Really hope you enjoyed that and we'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.